Hello, everyone, and welcome to Leading Indicator, a show by public.com, bringing you insights from the world's best macro minds. I'm your host, Kyla Scanlon. We are here with you today to discuss the concept of fiscal dominance, the relationship between interest rates and consumer price inflation, and whether the Fed has the tools to truly combat inflation. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to the YouTube channel for more in-depth interviews that will help keep you up with the latest investment news. Today, we are here with Lynn Alden founder of Lynn Alden Investment Research, who just published an incredible July note on markets. Lynn, welcome to public. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I want to ask you what everybody has been pretty much asking you about. So we all know that the Fed is raising rates in order to battle inflation. We have the CPI print this Wednesday, which is expected to show slowing inflation, but not slow enough for the Fed because of rents, et cetera. So can you break out the key themes driving the rate of inflation in the United States right now? So right now we have a period of disinflation. Uh, It's in part because energy uh, came off its highs uh, as the supply and demand balance normalized. And also, you know, both in the U.S. and globally, we've had slowing indicators. Uh, Some of them point towards recession. Other ones are still kind of in that gray zone where it's, you know, it's above a recession, but it's not exactly booming. And so by slowing down um, the state of the economy, they've had they've helped to get inflation under control. I think the, the biggest challenge is that when we look at the history of inflation, there's really two types of inflation. There's bank lending driven inflation, which we know from the 1970s. That's basically when, you know, public debts are pretty low. Most of the money creation is from bank lending. And so the Federal Reserve is primarily designed to try to control that type of inflation. Uh, And they can do so by raising rates, reducing rates, and taking other measures to try to influence either more loan creation or less loan creation. The other type of inflation is the type that we see normally around major crises or very high public debt uh, situations like World War One, World War Two, and here in the nineteen uh, here in the twenty twenties, which is fiscal driven inflation. So it's not because of excessive bank lending; it's because of very very large fiscal deficits that were that were monetized by the Fed. And I think the biggest challenge that the Fed finds themselves now is that they're fighting fiscal driven inflation with tools that are primarily meant to constrain bank lending. And so the best they can do is kind of slow down bank lending, which wasn't really accepted to begin with, to try to offset some of what happened from the fiscal side and as well as other things like energy supply chains, things like that. So they're getting inflation under control, but not necessarily the way we'd want, which is disinflationary growth. Hmm. Can you expand upon that idea of disinflationary growth? What does that mean and how does that tie into what the Fed is doing? So in general, when people say they want inflation under control, And if you were to ask and say, well, do you want a recession? They'd say, no, I don't don't want a recession. Uh, So what people really want is they want basically stable money and ongoing economic expansion, basically life getting better on average for for most people. Um, Whereas what the Fed's primarily trying to do is slow down the demand side enough to offset some of the inflation that happened. And so the challenge is that if you have very large fiscal driven inflation, and then you constrain the private sector enough that you cause a recession, you get the situation where it's not exactly what people wanted. You, you might hit your target, but it's kind of a pyrrhic victory because you know you hit inflation in a recession. And then the question becomes when you want to inflate out of that recession, you want to stimulate out of that recession, if you haven't actually addressed the core drivers of inflation, uh, the risk is that they're ready to reemerge as soon as you want to have another period of economic um, growth or re- reacceleration. So when you look at things like the Purchasing Managers Index, when you look at various kind of um, cyclical rate of change measures of economic growth, you know if inflation is this sticky on a downtrend in those indicators, we have to ask the question: What's going to happen with inflation next time we have another? you know, reacceleration, another period of growth. If we haven't addressed those core issues, if we've kind of suppressed other is- other areas enough to kind of get inflation under control paper over it, then the core issues are ready to reemerge unless we actually address those. Mm. And so when you talk about addressing these core issues of inflation, is that policy side stuff? So we have fiscal causing inflation. Is fiscal really the only thing that can save us from inflation in terms of policy? So I think there are a couple major factors. I think fiscal is a big part of it. Uh, it's hard to have inflation sustainably under 2% uh, if fiscal deficits are 5, 6, 7, 8, 9% of GDP. Um, it's basically you have, to, you have to shrink the private sector by a significant amount or you have to have absolutely massive productivity gains somewhere so that you know the growth in the money supply has got a bigger than normal gap between CPI changes. Like you see, for example, the 1990s, like you see you know, certain, certain periods. 
Um, the other side is energy security. So right now, Europe has some of the worst inflation problems in the developed world. And it's a large part because their energy side was worse than what the United States went through. They have less energy security. Um, and the ripple effects from that period are still hitting them, even though they've, they've you know, warm winter and other factors have, have largely stabilized it for now. Um, and so I think the other factor is making, you know, countries can make sure that they have energy security, which is, it is in some ways a fiscal decision, but it's a productive fiscal decision. It's basically saying, okay, what can we do to either get out of the way of energy production or encourage energy production um, so that, you know, in, in the subsequent years, we, we don't have another spike like that. Mm -hmm. And one of the risks is that here in the United States, um, we, so natural gas, unlike oil, uh, is not very fungible in the sense that um, you know transportation costs are a big piece of, of natural gas, whereas oil is relatively easy to bring around. And so when when European gas spiked and also Japanese gas spiked, we didn't see a similar magnitude in the United States because you can't just you know buy U.S. gas and immediately put it over in, the, in Europe. There's a limited amount, a limited amount of LNG export capacity. But over the coming years, they're building more and more of that. And so over time, you should, in theory, see a, a narrowing of that differential, which should be decent for Europe, but then could raise average U.S. natural gas prices, which is obviously good for producers, but not necessarily great for American consumers. And so I think over time, whether or not you're in the United States, whether or not you're in Europe or elsewhere, uh, the various components of the energy supply side are, are similarly important to getting fiscal uh, stabilized. Do you think that's the primary thing to go after is energy supply in order to make sure that inflation doesn't tick back up? Because energy is the common denominator, right? Or is there other like policy solutions that you see playing out? I think that's the main one. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. mostly so the state of just ever growing technology gives us a kind of a background disinflationary pressure. Um, and so right now, you know, AI and other productivity tools are a disinflationary force as well as you know, along with the recession. And so the main thing is we have to ask ourselves what could cause prices to go up on average. And so one is either unusually large money supply growth, like we saw in 2020 and 2021. Um, and it's probably not going to come from excessive bank lending. So the main culprit potentially to look out for is ongoing fiscal driven inflation. And the challenge there is that if you raise rates, even though that slows down the private sector, that actually increases the fiscal budget deficit because you're over 100% debt to GDP. So if you raise rates significantly, that's actually more money flowing into the economy, ironically. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the one big side. And then the other side is just the core things. It's, it's not just energy, it's also copper. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's various commodities that could, that could end up being a bottleneck in the years and, and decade ahead. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit more about money creation? Because a lot of investors don't really understand it. Like you'll see a lot of M2 charts just floating around Twitter. So could you explain like these sources of money supply, where they come from and how they impact economic levels and growth? Sure. And to do that, we can separate broad money from base money. So base money is like wholesale money. Uh, in, in the old days, that would be basically the gold supply. Um, in the modern time, that's basically the central bank balance sheet. They, you know, their liability side is essentially the monetary base for for the country that it that it that it you know has jurisdiction over. And banks, commercial banks, hold reserves uh, and people hold banknotes. Those are the, that's the monetary base. But then they also lend money into the economy. And 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 so when you have a deposit at a bank, you basically have a fractional claim to a piece of the monetary base. And that ratio can vary over time, right? So in 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 say the 1970s, it was near its peak. So you had a, a lot of broad money relative to the base money. And that broad money is what we mostly consider broad, like money supply. Like when you have money in account, when I have money in account, that's part of the broad money supply. That's the money that we interact with and that we, we kind of look at and decide what we're gonna spend or not spend on. And there's two primary ways that, that new money is created. One is when banks make loans, they, they can increase the money multiple in aggregate. And so they can they can loan more money into existence. Um, it's kind of unintuitive because in order to make loans, banks have to collect deposits and have all these reasonable kind of capital requirements and things like that. But on the other hand, when they when they lend, they they as a as an a aggregate number of banks, they increase the overall amount of deposits in the system. Uh, and so that that's one mechanism. So when you have either say above trend demographics, like say the 1970s, uh, when you know the baby boomer generation was entering their home buying years, you have higher than average lending. And so you can get above target, the kind of lending driven inflation. Um, the other main way that broad money supply can increase is if the federal government does some very massive 
uh, stimulus program. It could be a, it could be um, spending on a war and soldiers, and then and then you know putting them through college when they come back like the GI Bill. Basically, all these all these kind of ways of getting money to the economy could be stimulus checks, could be t- child care tax credits, could be PPP loans at certain grants, could be corporate um, bailouts, all that kind of stuff. It could even be unfunded tax cuts. If you just give people a big tax cut, but mm-hmm. you don't change spending, that's that's functionally similar to. Um, a spending increase. And so these these deficits are ways to inject money into the economy, especially when it's accompanied by the central bank also doing quantitative easing to increase the monetary base by those bonds. And, and so that that money is not being extracted from somewhere and put back in. It's instead being basically extracted from this new void of, of dollars and put in. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the two main ways are either fiscal deficits that are that are pretty big or if, if lending-driven inflation is running above target. And in the 2020s, as well as, say, the 1940s, fiscal-driven inflation was the primary um, means of money creation, whereas in most periods, lending-driven inflation uh, is, the, is the primary um, factor. Mm-hmm. And in the period that we're in now, is lending-driven inflation the primary factor? No, so the 2020s are mostly fiscal driven inflation. Oh, tw- yeah, okay. Uh, ever since the global financial crisis, lending has not been a particularly strong uh, driver of sure. inflation. Yeah. Uh, it's more been the deficit side. And in the, the 2010s, it was overall pretty muted because you had kind of moderate deficits, you had pretty low levels of bank lending inflation. Uh, but here in the 2020s, uh, largely because of all the stimulus response, um, we, we've had higher than average money creation, uh, of course, until, until very recently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the Fed, they recently paused their rate hikes, right, uh, to try and figure out what what's going on with inflation. They've hiked rates 10 consecutive times, um, and they seem really focused on using that as the primary tool. And so we talked about like some fiscal solutions, I think, but how should the Fed be combating inflation, or is this the primary way that they should be doing it, all things considered? I think one of the challenges is that it's, in some ways the federal – uh, reserves almost like the fourth branch of government. It, it's 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 a semi political organization, yeah. and and they have certain mandates. And it can be very politically hard to say we can't hit our mandates right now because there are things outside of our control. If there's a war and oil spikes at two dollars a barrel, you know their inflation target is going to have a problem. Uh, if fiscal deficits are running, say over ten percent of GDP, uh, which is not right now, but they were, you know it's kind of like saying this is just not our it's not our our tools can't necessarily address that. Um, but because confidence is a large part of the system, the Federal Reserve always essentially tries to say, okay, we're going we're gonna to use our tools. And the problem is that their tools are, are almost entirely designed around um, you know, either, either trying to stimulate more bank lending or reducing bank lending. And the problem is if that's, if that's a smaller component of money creation than fiscal deficits, then their, their overall impact is, is, is muted. And then if you get to a severe enough spot, like let's say let's say Japan, for example, they have over 250 percent debt to GDP, uh, public debt to GDP, uh, and bank lending is very sluggish there. Um, you know, demographics are declining. Um, there's not a, there's not a lot of booming credit demand. Um, and so if, if they raise rates, it would actually you know dramatically increase the um, budget deficit at a larger amount than it would affect bank lending. Uh, and so they could actually – it could be bad enough that inc- increases in rates could be inflationary unintuitively. Mm-hmm. So when public debts are low and most money creations from bank lending, rates do exactly what we think. We think that you know, okay, as we raise rates, it will slow down bank lending. That, that's normally how it works. If you get to a point where public debt is so high um, and demographics are sluggish enough – where most of the money creation is from fiscal deficits and public debt's high, then when you increase rates, um, in addition to not being very effective at slowing down inflation, there's a risk that actually increases inflation. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the United States is not really there yet, but we're kind of on this point where because the inflation is mostly fiscal driven and because public debts are pretty high, uh, it's just not a very effective tool, even though the Federal Reserve is not really in a position politically where they can say, it's not our problem. Uh, they have to kind of uh, take it on as their problem and, and, and try to use the tools they have. Yeah, they're in a, a really tough spot, it seems. And you spoke about Japan and sort of compared it to the United States in your recent newsletter. And you're through the looking glass theory. Can you talk about that a little bit more, this through the looking glass concept that you outlined in the newsletter? Yeah, so I used the analogy of Alice going through the looking glass. And when she went through the mirror, everything was flipped. Um, and 
when you know you see a lot of people saying, okay, if if four percent interest rates didn't fix inflation, we got to go to five. If five didn't do it, yeah. we got to go to six. If six doesn't do it, we got to go to seven. And I think it's important to back up and say, well, where is the money creation coming from, and what would what would we expect interest rates to do to that inflation? And so going back to my prior example, if if public debts are low and most money creations from bank lending, let's say the 1970s, for example, if public debt was 30 percent of GDP. Um, you know, baby boomers were entering their home buying years. So we had a lot of money creation. That was um, a period where raising rates is pretty effective at controlling inflation because you start to slow down that rate of lending, which slows down the rate of money creation. And even though you do increase the interest expense of the government, it's not a big deal because it's only 30% uh, debt to GDP. So that'll be a smaller effect than the effect you're having on bank lending. The mm -hmm. problem is that decade after decade, as you get to higher and higher public debt to GDP, let's say over 100%, uh, you start to get kind of a wash where if you raise rates, it does slow down bank lending, but also actually increases fiscal deficits, which which is another way of pouring money into the economy. And that's where the United States is now, where they're they're kind of playing those forces are kind of playing tug of war. Um, and then if you go far enough, uh, then you're through the looking glass, like Japan, where public debt is so high, bank lending is so low that you actually get a positive correlation. You risk having a positive correlation where higher interest rates could actually increase inflation. And the, the central bank basically loses its tools to combat inflation and becomes almost entirely a, a fiscal um, lever situation. And I think that the challenge is that calls for higher and higher rates have to take into account where is the money creation coming from? I mean, basically, if we if the more effective we are at controlling inflation by suppressing the private sector, the more likely we're just going to cause a recession, temporarily get inflation under control. But if the if the fiscal deficits are still there and we try to get out of that recession, we have to be ready for, for what may come, which is either another round of inflation, a period of stagflation. These are the risks that I think policymakers have to, to navigate. Yeah. And the Fed has a broader toolkit than just rates, right? So like, could they go to their balance sheet for this sort of thing? Or does that get into the whole lending problem where it's not lending that's the issue, but the fiscal side? So the balance sheet can be an effective tool. And I think actually right now that's being a more effective tool than uh, their interest rates are uh, because the, the balance sheet can slow down um, asset prices and things like mm -hmm. that without exacerbating public interest expense. Um, the challenge is that if you have very, very large deficits, um, after a certain point, the question becomes who buys those? Mm -hmm. um, and no central bank ever just lets its sovereign government uh, bonds just flail on the wind. Uh, if, if the bond market turns a liquid like it did in um, March 2020, yeah. or uh, as, as there are issues in September 19 with the repo spike, whenever you get kind of things that are adjacent to the sovereign bond market kind of breaking, the, the central bank always steps in and increases the balance sheet as needed. So right now, the Federal Reserve is able to reduce its balance sheet because there are other pools of liquidity. So the past um, six to nine months, uh, the Treasury drew down a lot of its liquidity. Lately, it's been refilling it. And then there's also nearly $2 trillion in reverse repos. I think it's down to $1.8 trillion now. It's been draining. So that's another pool of liquidity they can draw from to finance these large deficits. The problem is that once they run out of that pool um, and banks have certain liquidity requirements that they can't really go below, uh, you get to a point where the, the Federal Reserve might have to expand its balance sheet even if inflation is still above target. Uh, that, that's kind of the situation that Japan finds itself in where, you know, it's got above target deficits, it's got above target inflation, and yet they're still doing QE uh, as part of their yield curve control because someone has to buy those bonds. Um, and so I think that the balance sheet can be a tool that's useful in the intermediate term, but as long as those large deficits are still there, eventually someone's got to finance them. And at the kind of the you know the financier of last resort is, is always the the central bank. And so this will be my last question, and it's a, a big one. But what do you think the potential solution is? Is it starting to really be mindful of that deficit, or how do we sort of is it investing in energy? Like how do we navigate this new economy? Uh, so I, I mean I think policymakers and investors have different um, you know kind of things to do. I think from an investor standpoint. I've been emphasizing a three pillar portfolio, which is basically taking a normal, you know, uh, portfolio, but adding um, some energy and inflation components to it. So you take the normal portfolio, uh, you have equities uh, for the bond side, you might shorten the average duration. Uh, 
Uh, so you have more cash equivalents rather than long duration bonds. And then for that third component, you have you make sure you have some um, inflation or debasement hedges. So that could be things like uh, energy producers, uh, could be certain commodity producers, um, could be tips, uh, could be gold and Bitcoin, like kind of hard, you know, like scarce money assets. Yeah. And you have that segment, uh, and these are not necessarily thirds, right? It would obviously depend on the age of the investor, um, their volatility tolerance, uh, their overall kind of macro outlook, but you can kind of dial those around to say, okay, the, the stocks and the cash equivalents prefer a period of disinflation. They, they prefer disinflationary growth, whereas some of these other things might be bottlenecks that should they become exacerbated like energy, uh, at least that part of the portfolio might offset some of the damage that's happening to the stocks and the, the cash or bonds. Yeah, that, um, that makes a lot of sense. It's definitely a balance at this point. This has been really helpful. Thank you, Lynn. Where can people find you? Uh, so I'm at lindalden.com. I have public articles, public newsletter. People can check that out. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks so much.